Go ahead and open your Bibles up to the book of Zephaniah. For the next several weeks, we'll be in this incredible book. Tonight, we get an introduction to the singular theme of this book, and that is the day of the Lord, the day of Yahweh. In chapter 1, verse 1, follow along as I read. The word of Yahweh, which came to Zephaniah, son of Cushi, son of Gedaliah, son of Amariah, son of Hezekiah, in the days of Josiah, son of Ammon, king of Judah. I want to point out the, in this superscription, the, the way the book begins, there are a couple features that function as bookends to this entire prophecy. Just look again at verse 1, that beginning phrase, the word of Yahweh, the word of the Lord. That is the opening phrase of this entire prophecy. And if you just flip to the end of the book, you'll also see that it ends very much in the same way as it begins. Just look at the last words. The last words of this prophecy are, says Yahweh, says the Lord. This book begins and ends with a word from God, signifying that it is a word from God. And since the beginning and end of this book have to do with the word of the Lord, what God has said, that is a pronouncement that everything between the first and last verses are indeed the voice of God. These have a singular theme what we just saw at the end of the book is the end of Zephaniah's articulation of the end of the world as it will be. By the end of this prophecy, he takes us all the way to the end of the world, of the world history. And this is a description in his own terms of the end of the world as it will be. But before we get to the end of the world as it will be, we first have to read and learn about the end of the world as we know it. And that's where we pick up in chapter 1, verse 2. The end of the world as we know it. This uh, no other prophet opens or introduces himself documenting his genealogy four generations the way Zephaniah does. And the reason he rushes to his ancestor, the good king Hezekiah, even in the days of Josiah, is to note that he has a connection to a godly heritage. This prophet stands in a line of godly men, tracing all the way back to the good king of Judah, Hezekiah. Yet the prophecy appears, it's written in the days of Josiah, another and the final good king of Judah. He is the son of Ammon, king of Judah. And here are Zephaniah's prophetic words about this coming day of the Lord. This is about the end of the world as we know it. Look at verse 2. I says the Lord, will completely remove all things from the face of the earth, declares Yahweh. I will remove man and beast. I will remove the birds of the sky and the fish of the sea and the ruins along with the wicked. 
and I will cut off man from the face of the earth, declares Yahweh. So I will stretch out my hand against Judah and against all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and I will cut off the remnant of Baal from this place. And the names of the idolatrous priests along with the priests and those who bow down on the housetops to the host of heaven and those who bow down and swear to Yahweh and yet swear by Milcom and those who have turned back from following Yahweh and those who have not sought Yahweh or inquired of him. This is a description, the introductory description of the end of the world as we know it. What we'll see in this passage is that God's judgment, ending the world as we know it, takes aim at two targets. God's judgment, ending the world as we know it, takes aim at two targets. The first target at which God's judgment takes aim is seen in verses two and three. This is the world in general, the world in general. You have a parallel structure in the first half of this passage. And then in the second half verses two and three mirror a parallel structure to verses four through six. And as he begins to describe this end of the world, this first target at which God's judgment takes aim, the world in general, the first thing that we see about the world in general is the judgment declared. The judgment declared. Look at verse 2. There's just a declaration about this coming judgment when he says, I will completely remove all things from the face of the earth, declares Yahweh. This is a declaration of this coming judgment. There is a complete removal, or if you're reading another translation, the ESV, sweeping away of all things. So this judgment is first declared. And that phrase, the the phrase that we find that gets translated in the English complete removal or a completely removing, there's a verb that appears four times in really quick succession in the Hebrew. Uh, You see it again in in English in verse three, I will remove, I will remove. Hard to see here in, in verse two, but the completely remove, the verb is mentioned two times, which is just a Hebraic way of intensifying or extending the the meaning of the verb. So the complete removal, it's remove, remove, really remove, entirely remove all things. And so you've got this same verb appearing four times, making it absolutely undeniable that this judgment is coming. And just notice the future tense, I will I will, I will, this is coming. This is future. It's forward looking. And then two times the judgment is declared because you have at the end of this declaration, the end of verse two, and then the end of verse three declares Yahweh. God is speaking personally for himself of his own accord this will most certainly happen. The language is interesting here. This removal, it's not a gathering or a removal to replace something. This is uh, extermination language. It's a complete extermination of what he's call, calling everything or all things. Everything absolutely is touched by this judgment is the point. Nothing escapes this judgment when it comes. No people and nothing else under creation. 
And, and we see these categories laid out for us in not only the judgment declared, but now the judgment described. Once the judgment is declared that it will in fact take place, then the judgment is described. And we see this description appear in a variety of ways in verses two and three. This judgment is comprehensive. It is familiar. It is devastating and it is punitive. All of these things appear in these couple of verses. First off, this is comprehensive. This is a comprehensive judgment. This comprehensive, the comprehensive nature of this judgment is demonstrated in just the vocabulary that is being used. Again, verse two, completely remove all things. Uh, the, the construction is similar to what we find in Genesis 2 when God tells Adam, the day you eat of it, you will surely die. You will die, die is the idea. You will certainly die. This is a uh, certain, complete, comprehensive kind of extermination that will come upon the world when the day of the Lord arrives. And if the vocabulary weren't enough, then certainly the creatures listed would be enough to demonstrate the comprehensive nature of the judgment. Look again, verse three, I will remove, and then we get a list, man and beast. I will remove birds of the sky and fish of the sea and the ruins along with the wicked. And then again, I will cut off man or cause man to be cut off from the face of the earth, declares the Lord. This is comprehensive. Everything is touched by this judgment. This isn't the only place where we see creation suffering from the effects of man's sin. You might wonder why in the world are beasts, birds, and fish mentioned. What did they do? Can you think of any other places in scripture where creation suffers because of man's sin? It's all over. Just go back to Genesis 3. We'll see this here. As soon as man sins, creation gets subjected to futility. What God tells to Adam in verse 17 of Genesis 3, then to Adam he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree about which I commanded you saying you shall not eat from it, Cursed is the ground because of you. In toil, you will eat of it all the days of your life, both thorns and thistles. It shall grow for you and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face, you will eat bread till you return to the ground because from it you were taken for you are dust and to dust you shall return. Prior to this point in human history, which wasn't very much history, but prior, there were no thorns and thistles. When we go pick weeds in our yard, it's a good opportunity every time we do that with the kids. You know why weeds grow? Because of Adam's sin. Because of man's sin. That's why we have this job to do, to uh, satisfy the requirements of our HOA. This is all due to Adam's sin. Prior to this time, you would have had no weeds to pick in your, in your yard. And you probably wouldn't have had rock yards. In Genesis 4.4, 4, this is uh, similar. What about, well, we shouldn't miss in chapter 3, by the way. Notice in verse 21, Yahweh God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. What's happening there? What creation is suffering? Some poor animal who did not sin against God is now having to cover man because of his sin. The same idea is picked up in chapter four, 
verse 4, when it says, Abel on his part also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of their fat portions, and Yahweh had regard for Abel and for his offering. So here you have animals of some kind being offered up from the flock as an offering for Abel's sin. Their creation is suffering for man's sin. And then you could compound these examples, just most notably thinking of uh, the Exodus, the plagues in Egypt. The water gets turned to blood, and what happens? Fish die. The water and then the land become putrid. You have the curses laid out in Deuteronomy. Uh, In order to send a message to God's rebellious, wayward people, What does he have to do to creation? He has to further subject the creation to futility so that it doesn't work properly. The skies don't rain. The clouds don't hold water. Things don't grow from the ground. Everything is cursed under heaven to communicate to man something true about God. He hates sin. He is just. He has been good to you. Similarly, on this day of the Lord that Zephaniah is documenting for us, creation will be further subjected to futility. And it will be done so in a comprehensive way. Not only is the judgment described comprehensive, but it's also familiar. This is a familiar judgment. Just notice in verse 2 again, I will completely remove all things from the face of the earth, declares Yahweh. That word earth, if you're reading the New American Standard Bible, you should have a footnote that says literally ground. And then the same thing is mentioned in verse 3 at the end, and I will cut off man from the face of the earth, or better translated, ground. This is the same word for dust, So man was made from the dust that we just read in chapter three, and he's going to return to the dust. That is the word uh, Adama. Sounds like Adam, the word for man. Adam, man, Adama, ground or dust. That's the word that we see here. But why is this a familiar judgment being described? The reason this is familiar is because you find this same phrase way back in Genesis chapter 6. Flip back there. Genesis 6. There was another judgment that came upon man that was because of man's sin. And the entire creation experienced the detrimental effects of God's judgment against man's sin. Just look at Genesis 6, verse 5. Then Yahweh saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Yahweh was sorry that he had made man on the earth and he was grieved in his heart. Yahweh said, I will blot out man whom I have created from, here's our phrase, the face of the earth or the land, literally ground. From man to animals to creeping things and to birds of the sky, for I am sorry that I have made them. There you get such a similar phrasing, an exact phrase, the face of the ground is the same there or the face of the Adama. And then you get, again, specific categories of created things being affected by this judgment that's coming. Man, animals, you get creeping things, birds of the sky. So the similarities are obvious. So this familiarity of the coming day of the Lord is reminiscent of the judgment against Noah's generation. This is reminiscent of the judgment against Noah's generation when he will remove man from the face of the ground. 
You'll also notice if you just keep your hand there, from the face of the earth declares Yahweh, Zephaniah says. And then he repeats that. From the face of the earth declares Yahweh. Notice in Genesis 6, 7, how the statement of this judgment that would come in Noah's day is introduced. Yahweh said. Yahweh said. So here you have Yahweh speaking about a coming judgment in Noah's day. And then in Zephaniah repeats, picked up, picks up very much the same phrasing to say that similar, something similar. God is saying judgment is coming. And so this is reminiscent of the judgment against Noah's generation for that reason. But it's also because of what immediately follows. If you knew your Torah well, then you would have known that this is also, this would have reminded you not only of the judgment against Noah's generation, but also of the favor toward Noah. Because look what immediately follows the statement about God's judgment. Chapter 6, verse 8 in Genesis. But Noah, here's a contrast, but Noah found favor in the eyes of Yahweh. It's almost like Zephaniah is intentionally picking his words so that he would remind his audience not only of the familiarity of the judgment, this is worldwide destruction that's coming, but maybe just like in Noah's day, there's a chance for you. Maybe you too can find favor with Yahweh if you, like Noah, are blameless in your day. I believe this is why Zephaniah is picking this particular wording to describe a completely new judgment to come. Also worth noting that the book of the law was found in Zephaniah's day or in Josiah's day. The book of the law was recovered. This prophecy is most likely preceding the recovery of the book of the law. But considering Zephaniah's lineage, it would make sense that the word was passed down. Uh, Hezekiah even recovered Proverbs written by Solomon. You have that documented for us in, in, in the book of Proverbs. And so Zephaniah standing in this line of godly men, at least some of them, being of royal blood, it is likely that he would have been familiar with God's revelation and is reminding them of former words articulated by the first prophet to author scripture, Moses. And when that book was finally recovered, it would have illuminated all the more Zephaniah's message for his hearers. So this judgment being described as comprehensive, it's familiar. It is also devastating. It is also devastating. Notice the order in which, according to verse 3, these things are being removed. This destruction is coming. It's coming to man and beast and birds of the sky and fish of the sea. That, again, is no accident. This is a, a prophet very familiar with the details of the Torah. Let me show you this. Go back to Genesis 1. We're going to be doing this a lot, by the way. Flipping back to what Moses has written, because there are so many astonishing parallels that just make, make it so helpful to understanding the significance of what Zephaniah is saying, found all the way back at the beginning of your Bible. Moses recording God's words to him about how the specific way in which God created notes, according to verse 20 of Genesis chapter one, just look at the order in which God articulates his creative work. Genesis 1 20, then God said, let the waters teem with swarms of living creatures and let birds fly above the earth in the open expanse of the heavens. 
God created the great sea monsters and every living creature that moves with, with which the waters swarmed after their kind and every winged bird after its kind. And God saw that it was good. Verse 22, God blessed them saying, be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters of the seas and let birds multiply on the earth. There was evening and there was morning the fifth day. This all occurred on day five. Notice three times in these verses, we get the order kept the same. First, God speaks and he fills the waters with living creatures and then birds in the sky or in the open expanse of the heavens, it says. When God speaks, he first speaks of creatures in the water and then creatures in the heavens. And then God actually created them and the order is kept the same. Sea monsters and every living creature that moves, which with the water uh, team or swarm after their kind. And then comes again, birds after the sea creatures are mentioned. And then after he gives the blessing in verse 22, the order is the same sea creatures and then birds. Zephaniah gives the exact opposite. If you're going backwards through verse three, he gives sea monsters last or fish of the sea and then birds just preceding that. So his order is reversed. He does the same thing when he mentions man and beast. Just notice Zephaniah's order is man and then beast. But that is not the way that God created on day six, according to verse 24 of Genesis 1. Then God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures after their kind, cattle and creeping things and beasts of the earth after their kind. And it was so. God made the beasts of the earth after their kind and the cattle after their kind and everything that creeps on the ground after its kind. And God saw that it was good. Then verse 26 says, God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness and let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. And then God created man, male and female. He created them. So the order that Moses records is beast first and then man. And then the order is kept the same when God gives man dominion over all of those things, sea creatures, birds, and then cattle and things that creep on the earth. All of that highlights the devastation that Zephaniah is mentioning because by mentioning these things in precisely the opposite order that Moses recorded them, man, beast, birds, fish of the sea, he's describing the creation in reverse. And so it highlights the devastating effects of the judgment. This is the undoing of creation. When God made them, he established creation. He filled the earth. He called it good. This is something else entirely. This is the exact opposite. Creation is being uncreated. It is being devastated, destroyed entirely. Notice at the end of verse three, the punitive nature of this judgment as well. Because not only is every element of creation touched, but he also says what's going to be exterminated, removed, swept away is the ruins along with the wicked. What is that? You've got a couple possibilities. This is either that which has been ruined by man's wickedness, or it is the ruin, the word could also be translated stumbling blocks, that have ruined man. So the things that man has ruined in his wickedness or the things that have been a stumbling block ruinous to him 
in being wicked. Either way, what God is saying is that those things that have been a part of man's sinful activity on the earth are also under the judgment. They will also be touched by this judgment. So whether man worships the hosts of the heavens, as we'll see later in the passage, whether it's silver and gold, whether it is relationships, whether it is uh, fame and fortune, all of those things will experience the destructive effects of the day of the Lord when it comes. And again, he says he will cut off. It could be translated, he will cause, I will cause to be cut off from the face of the ground, declares Yahweh. He will cause man to be cut off. That just, again, brings to the the forefront the way this is, is worded, this particular Hebrew stem, that God is the one causing this, he is not detached. It is not like, as Kyle mentioned this morning, creation is just spinning on its own and God's sitting back watching creation go. We're not deists. Zephaniah was not a deist. God is intimately involved and he is the one bringing this event about. God is the cause, ultimately, of this event. But because he's the one causing it to be, he's the one causing man to be cut off, then that also implies that there are means that God is using. God is using means to bring about this destruction, but it's him who's doing it. He's bringing this about. So, yes, this is punitive. This Destruction is coming for sinners, for wicked man. Do you, do you think about this? Do you think about a time on earth when no one will be able to escape this awful judgment of God? Do you ever take time to meditate? What's that going to be like? What would it be like to be here when creation is undone? The one who holds together the word, the the created universe by the word of his power, Hebrews 1 says, what would it be like to be here when that one with a word begins to undo creation? Where would you stand? Where would you hide? Where would you go? Where would you flee for protection? Where the birds are in the sky, they have nowhere to hide. The fish in the sea, in the depths of the sea, they have nowhere to hide. Everything else on land, it has nowhere to hide. Where would you go? What would you feel? We would do well to consider these things. Because this day is coming. This is what Zephaniah is causing his readers to consider at this particular time. As the prophet prophesied in Judah, he's not content. God is not considering it enough to just depict for his people a worldwide judgment. And so he goes further. He goes further, describing the second target at which this judgment that ends the world as we know it takes aim. And that's point two in in our outline, his people in particular. The second target is his people in particular. That's right. Judah, hearing this, being the only portion, the, the tribal allotment left in the land, The prophet wants them to know, God wants them to know through Zephaniah, the world's going to experience this coming day of the Lord. And guess what? You take center stage. You are a primary reason that God's day is coming. Just look at verse four. So I will stretch out my hand against Judah and against all the inhabitants of Jerusalem. This 
Jerusalem was the pride and joy of this tribe. There are portions of scripture that talk about the beauty of this city at times. This was intended to be the capital of the world one day. The Messiah would reign from the throne of David in this city. The lion of the tribe of Judah that Israel prophesied about. And yet here at this point in God's redemptive history, this is not that time. Something else is coming to Jerusalem. Something else is coming to Judah. And it is an outstretched hand. That's not good news. You know, sometimes you might think of an outstretched hand, just lend a hand for help of some sort. This is not that. Go back to Exodus chapter 7, and we'll see what this outstretched hand is exactly. Because this is another instance of Zephaniah picking up on Moses' language to describe a new kind of judgment. Yahweh is speaking to Moses as he sends him to Egypt. And look what he sends his prophet to tell this hard-hearted person in Pharaoh, people, the Egyptians, verse 3. But I will harden Pharaoh's heart that I may multiply my signs and my wonders in the land of Egypt. When Pharaoh does not listen to you, then I will lay my hand on Egypt and bring out my hosts my people, the sons of Israel from the land of Egypt by great judgments. The Egyptians shall know that I am Yahweh when I stretch out my hand on Egypt and bring out the sons of Israel from their midst. That's the outstretched hand. The the hand is outstretched for the purpose of judgment. Look at verse 20. So Moses and Aaron did even as Yahweh had commanded, and he lifted up the staff and struck the water that was in the Nile in the sight of Pharaoh and in the sight of his servants, and all the water that was in the Nile was turned to blood. This happens numerous times throughout the judgments. They come by means of an outstretched hand through the prophet Moses as he holds up his staff or holds out his hands. Just a couple more references for you. In chapter 8, verse 5, we see another outstretched hand. Then Yahweh said to Moses, say to Aaron, stretch out your hand with your staff over the rivers, over the streams, and over the pools, and make frogs come up on the land. So Aaron stretched out his hand over the waters of Egypt, and the frogs came up and covered the land of Egypt. This brought on God's judgments. And then jump down to verses 16 and 17. One more reference. Then Yahweh said to Moses, say to Aaron, stretch out your staff and strike the dust of the earth that it may become gnats through all the land of Egypt. They did so. And Aaron stretched out his hand with his staff and struck the dust of the earth. And there were gnats on man and beast. All the dust of the earth became gnats through all the land of Egypt. So this again, just like you had a, the judgment declared against the world in general, you have here the judgment declared against Judah in particular by means of an outstretched hand. And then again, just like you had the judgment declared and described against the world in general, here you have the same thing, the judgment declared and then described. The hand is outstretched, that's the declaration, and then you have the judgment described. Here, Against God's people in particular, the judgment is described specifically. Judah, that's a specific people. Jerusalem, that's a specific place. Just like the judgment was punitive against the world, the judgment is punitive against God's people. Just look at the categories that are given in verse 4. 
I will cut off the remnant of Baal from this place and the names of the idolatrous priests along with the priests. Specific punitive judgment coming against worshipers within a God-forsaken system. That's why you get Baal mentioned. This would have been a kind of fertility God uh, that sanctioned temple prostitution and all kinds of sexual immorality. And they, people would engage in these promiscuous acts as a way to appease or invoke the favor of this false God. And this says, when the day of the Lord comes, the remnant, what remains is the remnant, they will be cut off from that place, Jerusalem. And not only the remnant of Baal, but the names of the idolatrous priests. This is a reference even to the memory of these people will be removed from the land along with the priests themselves. So their names and the priests. This has uh, been taken to mean that the prophecy must have been fulfilled in Zephaniah's day because it's not like they have uh, worshippers, some, some religious cult well-known in the world today following Baal. I don't think that's the right implication to take from this. I think that when he says they will be cut off as well as idolatrous priests, if this cult doesn't exist currently, then it will by the time the day of the Lord comes. Or it still exists in some form and is just not well known. You have instances of this in the Bible. Uh, you remember the, the bronze snake that Moses made in the wilderness? And you don't hear about it for forever until later and I believe it's Second Kings when the, the serpent is identified as still around and being worshipped by some segment of the Israelite people. And so it is possible that there is still a cult following of this same God that came from biblical times. Um, there is even today a small... A religious following of um, one of the judge's daughters, uh, Jephthah, who he sacrificed and uh, was in, in her virginity, never saw marriage. He sacrificed her in a perverted act of uh, keeping his vow to Yahweh. And apparently that there's still people who have turned her into the figurehead of some cult religion in our day. And so this is not evidence that the day of the Lord is still not future, but just that when it comes, these things will be still being practiced. So the description is specific. It's punitive. Notice it's also um, wise in verse five. It's wise. This judgment is wise. This is not an indiscriminate judgment. This is not God throwing a temper tantrum, but this has specific sinful practices in view. Specific religious practices or sinful practices in view. Idolatry being the first one mentioned. Verse five, those who bow down on the housetops to the host of heaven. This is... Those who worship creation, those who exalt creation as worthy of their highest thoughts, affection, care, concern, they devote the best of their time, energy, and resources to creation, um, they worship them. There are people who actually did this in Zephaniah's day. even in our day, worship the stars, the sun, 
the moon. Horoscopes are a manifestation of worship of the heavenly objects. And so God's judgment is coming for those who worship creation in this way. Not only for idolaters, but also for hypocrites. Verse 5, those who bow down and swear to Yahweh and yet swear by Milcom. So these people worship in form Yahweh and they also worship Milcom. This would have uh, probably been uh, Malek, the God to which children were sacrificed in biblical times. And so these are syncretists, people who claim the God of the Bible and yet blend that religious worship with other forms of religious worship. This is what the Catholic church has been known for doing forever, going into new cultures. And that's one way of conquering the world, I guess. You just go and your conversion is just to put Bible names and saint names on their already sinful, idolatrous, pagan practices. That's the idea of what's being described. They swear by Yahweh and yet swear by Milcom. They claim devotion to both and find no discrepancy in that practice. Well, the day of the Lord is coming for those people, the universalists of the day. These are hypocrites, idolaters, and then the final two categories of people that we get are apostates and atheists. Look at verse 6. Those who have turned back from following Yahweh, that's apostasy, and those who have not sought Yahweh or inquired of him, that's atheism. Those who have turned back from following Yahweh, they have at some point in time been devoted, claimed to be devoted to Yahweh. In Matthew 13, Jesus talks about the four different types of soils. He describes one kind of person on which the word of God comes, the seed falls, and he embraces it with joy. And yet because of persecution, because of difficulty, he falls away and goes back to the world. That's the idea. That's an apostate, one who walks away from the faith. And that doesn't necessarily mean that the person doesn't claim to be a Christian anymore, but their footsteps do not walk in the way of Yahweh. They go a different way. And some of those people who go a different way leave the name behind. Some don't. Some still claim to be Christians. And yet they deny God's power by their deeds. The atheism is seen in the way this passage ends. Those who have not sought Yahweh or inquired of him, they just treat God like he doesn't exist. Maybe they claim him, but they don't seek him. They don't inquire of him. They don't make his opinion the rule of their lives. You probably know people like this. They claim the name of Christ. Oh, I'm a Christian. And they just can't tell you what the Bible even says. They have no idea. They are not interested in reading it. That is what is meant by they don't inquire of him. They don't even want to know what he has to say. They don't even want to know what God thinks about the way they live. They're perfectly content going throughout life, not knowing or caring what God thinks about the way they're living. So they haven't sought him. They haven't inquired of him. Just notice when it says they have not sought Yahweh, they don't seek Yahweh. This is interesting because this is the same word that appears in chapter 2, verse 3, as instructions for how to be hidden from the coming judgment. 
Look at verse 3. Zephaniah gives these instructions. Seek Yahweh. How simple is that? Seek him. This would come to the humble of the earth. Those who respond to this command are the humble of the earth. So by contrast, those who have not sought him or inquired of him are the proud. To not seek God's opinion on a matter is pride. It is arrogant to not know what he want, to not want to know what he thinks. The day of the Lord comes because people refuse to seek Yahweh. So seek him. And if you seek him in sincerity, seek him to know him. Seek him to, verse 3, carry out his ordinances because you are pursuing righteousness, because you are pursuing humility, then perhaps you will be hidden in the day of Yahweh's anger. That is the solution to man's dilemma, to all of the sins listed here for which the day of the Lord comes, seek Yahweh. Stephen Charnock says about this practical atheism, something we can all relate to. He says, we have durable thoughts of transitory things and flitting thoughts of durable, a durable and eternal good. How often does that describe us? You, you, you carve out just five minutes to pray and you spend four and a half minutes distracted. This should not be the case. We should press for a higher pursuit of the Lord, a higher knowledge of him. Some implications briefly to draw from this passage. Knowing what God's going to do to the world, don't bother trying to save the world. Don't bother trying to save the earth. God is going to undo creation. There's nothing that we're going to do to stop it. So the climate activists of our day don't follow their instruction. And since you're not going to follow their instruction, I hope you're not eager. I hope you're eager to not follow those instructions. The opposite of what they are encouraging the salvation of the earth, we should actually pursue the salvation of people. That's the one pursuit we should have. The earth isn't going to last. The best you can do is be saved from the wrath to come. So we should be telling people this wrath is coming. You don't want to be here when the day of the Lord arrives and you don't have to be seek the Lord. This God is a God of just, justice and judgment. Just think about what's being depicted here. This is perfect, wise, righteous, just, good judgment coming upon sinners. Don't try and stop God from being good. Don't try and stop God from being just and withhold the wrath from coming. It's coming. It should come. It will come. Bring his salvation to people. That means for us, we have to do more than just be good neighbors, keeping our yards clean, friendly in our interactions with the people in our neighborhoods, with our coworkers. We have to actually at some point open our mouths and tell them Zephaniah's message. Did you know wrath is coming? Because that's probably not popular. You probably don't have many people in your life saying you're in trouble with God. Wrath is coming. If you don't seek the Lord, if you don't inquire of him, then wrath is coming for you. You must repent and flee to him for refuge. Take refuge in the character of God, the mercy and grace and long suffering of God, most clearly demonstrated in the cross of Christ. Mercy, grace, long-suffering are to those who fear him and believe in that crucified Messiah. You must flee there for refuge and safety. Not many people saying that to your neighbors. That's why God's had you move into that neighborhood. 
we are on the hook for our neighbor's souls, in a sense. And so we must open our mouths, whether that means walking around the neighborhood and knocking on the doors of our neighbors, spending more time outside where there are passersby so we can establish communication relationships with people who need to know wrath is coming. Maybe you just go way out of your way and put a sign in your yard that says wrath is coming. Repent. Zephaniah 2, 3 at the, at the bottom. All of those will be fair game. But people must hear about this day. People must hear about this judgment that is coming. And one other implication. Just notice, just like Judah and Jerusalem are most on the hook, they are because they're the most responsible. Judah, Jerusalem, received the greatest degree of revelation, the greatest quantity of revelation on earth. They had the greatest promises given to them. The the Messiah is of your own tribe. He's going to reign in your own city. And all of these prophets coming to you, prophesying about the, the splendor that this city is destined for, you're most on the hook. Here's the parallel for us. To whom much is given, much is required. We have received a wealth of revelation, 66 books full. Do you know it? Do you search it? Do you treasure it? Do you live like you're responsible for responding to it? Much has been given to us, much is required. So all of the gravity warranted by such an implication from the text, feel the weight of that. And just like we heard from Kyle this morning, we're not left with the weight of a command without the resources to go fulfill it, but we have the power of God himself working in us, working for us, working on our behalf and through us to accomplish what he's commanded. As you think about bringing the gospel, know that you have divine power backing you. The very message that you proclaim is divinely powerful to save sinners. And so go forth in hope and confidence as you feel the weight of this command, feel the weight of the hope and resources that you have at your disposal to then go obey God. Let's pray. God, thank you for such hope, such revelation to be warned of coming wrath, to be saved from coming wrath all by your grace to impart the gift of faith in us. Even as we hear these ancient words to actually believe them, that as we read these words and look all across Revelation, those who know Christ believe these things. That is a miracle because these words are not commensurate with our own wisdom. They don't align with our understanding. We, at one point prior to salvation, thought they were absurd. We thought they were foolish. And yet now we view them as your very power power to save, power to subdue man, power to judge the world. God, equip us with a heart of compassion that we would put off a fear of man in exchange for the fear of you to take up these words and communicate them to others. I pray that these would have their proper effect in our lives, in our churches, uh, in our church, in our neighborhoods, and wherever we find ourselves, that we would be faithful ambassadors Uh, proclaiming a message of salvation from coming wrath. And we know that you are eager to make your name famous through this very message. And so we pray you would make us useful to that end. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.